covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. If you enjoy your weekly tech news with a slight Linux bias, become part of our fleet. Choose your rank at patreon.com slash category 5. Let's get into it. Elon Musk has augmented a monkey's brain with a wireless implant so it can play video games. That's coming up. But first, did SpamCop block your email this past weekend? You're not alone. SpamCop, a respected anti-spam service provided by Cisco, had a hiccup this past weekend that resulted in countless emails being blocked as spam, even though they were perfectly benign. The issue affected users around the world, impacting the flow of email even for users who have never heard of or purposefully used SpamCop. That's because SpamCop is a service used by many ISPs, email providers, and servers along the way to check if emails flowing through their network are untrusted. So if SpamCop says this is spam, one of those servers will bounce it back to the sender and halt delivery. The issue arose when the spamcop.net domain name expired over the weekend as Cisco's admin team failed to renew it before the expiry date. Having expired, SpamCop stopped responding to these queries from mail servers around the world, thereby making them think that since the response was not a positive one, it must be negative and the email should be rejected. Fortunately, the spamcop.net domain was renewed pretty quickly, but not before mail servers around the world received all their email back as spam. Having now been renewed, everything is effectively back to normal and email is flowing fine. I can't say as I had any emails this weekend get blocked. No. That I'm aware that of. That you know of. But what if someone was emailing you? Well, that's possible. Yeah. But I did end up sending an email, come to think of it, Sunday to a number of people that I normally send. Yeah. And my wife pointed out to me yesterday or the day before, she's like, oh, look, it says spam in the subject line. Oh. And so even that's though it possible. delivered to her, it got flagged as possible spam. Weird. So I don't know if that's related to it. Maybe, but, maybe uh, not. Yeah. I know from my perspective uh, in IT, um, uh, immediately, Monday morning, I started having um, users of our email service saying people tried to email me on the weekend and it bounced back. Hmm. And I said, well, could you send me the, the daemon message? So I got that and I looked it over and I investigated and sure enough, I saw a spam cop. So I replied, well, it looks like maybe the sender was on the spam cop list and I ran a test on their IP address and it was showing that it was clean. Hmm. So I said, well, no, it, it looks like they, they maybe were, were flagged, but they didn't, uh, you know, they, they got off the list. Right. Because it's fine now. Then two days later, the news about. breaks. <laughs> that's right. That oh, actually, the spam cop domain name that's administered by Cisco expired. How is that? Like that's an oversight. Yeah, a huge one. A little bit. I've mentioned it before. Like, come on, get a NEM server to tell you. Oh, by the way, I mean, maybe maybe I'm being a little bit. You know, maybe I should back up because that's. That's a little rude. <laughs> this is a weird time. It, it, and it I have really to be real. Okay, how could this possibly happen to Cisco? And I think that's what immediately goes through our heads. Right. Well, what, was, what the heck was the admin doing? Why were they ignoring the emails? And then I'm starting to think here, Jeff, like we're in the middle of a pretty serious pandemic. We are. Is this a case where an administrator who is supposed to conduct that renewal is perhaps working from home? And, and, or maybe they're, they're for load, or maybe the, the person who receives those emails is not available well, because of this. That could be. And so it's interesting because for myself, you know, we talked about it a little bit ago in the news, like mm -hmm. I have my own domains. Yeah. And one of the things I have done is when I uh, sign up for particular services, i.e. like registering a domain or something. Yeah. I create a specific email for my dom for the domains okay. where all my registrations go to that email mm -hmm. and then I have it set up as forwarders so that if for whatever reason the email that it would go to I no longer have access to, right. I can change the forwarder okay. or something like that. Yeah, that's and something. so it makes me wonder if this is one of those cases where somebody had registered under whatever email address, maybe they're no longer with the company, yeah. they weren't available and so they weren't getting the alerts. You know, yep. even though they're coming in like, hey, it's going to expire, it's going to expire, it's going to expire, mm -hmm. and then you'd see it. It's possible. I take a different approach, and, and what I do is I set up automatic renewal. And no, that so, makes sense. And so that way, as a domain comes due, 
my registrar automatically bills my credit card and it gets renewed. So That's could hard. this be a case of maybe, I mean, a company like Cisco, what, why would they not pre-register a domain for 10 years? Is Good it point. possible that maybe it was come and, come and due and the credit card that they had on file and the contact that they had on file might have been somebody that's not with the company now. Oh, that could be. Could be a number There's of There's so many, you know, possibilities as to what could have happened. But I mean, this is a big deal because it knocked out the infrastructure that is there for email service around the world. Mm -hmm. So understanding that so many services depend on the reporting of services such as SpamCop. So if SpamCop stops responding all of a sudden, they just say, oh, well, reject that email. Yeah. Which is a, you know, that's maybe a little bit of a, a flaw in the infrastructure. Absolutely. It's like a single point of failure, right? Well, and there should be redundancies in that case, where if that doesn't work, here's your secondary backup. Yeah. You know, yeah. something like but that. But it, it still falls on Cisco to have those backups in place. That's and, right. You know, so, so what do you do? Because as soon as you put a redundancy in that says, if Spam, SpamCop is not responding, reroute it here. Now there's something that we can exploit. Right. There's something that we can use to get around SpamCop. Yeah. Which is, you know, concern. And what would have happened if somebody was wise to the fact, that, oh, this isn't working. Why isn't it working? Oh, the domain's out. I'm going to buy the domain. <laughs> like, Spamcop.net is now owned by Jeff Weston. Like, yeah. could you imagine the havoc that would reach? Because now it's a matter of I'm the legitimate domain owner. Yeah. You let it expire. I bought it. Sure. The whole thing goes down. <laughs> and what happens if you hold? It's like, I'll sell Luckily, it luckily, <laughs> the registrant, the whole mechanism behind uh, how registration works is that there's a 30-day grace That's period. Right. So um, after the 30-day grace period, had they not realized and not renewed, then it goes to auction. Yeah. And auction allows people to buy it up at a cost. And if it does not sell in auction, then it goes up at regular price. Right. And people can register it. Yeah. So never let your domains expire. If they're important to you, set something up that is going to automatically renew it and make sure that you keep in touch with your registrar in such a way that you've always got an up-to-date email address on there. If you change your email, make sure you update your registrar um, because otherwise someone's going to say, oh, well, that email doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm going to register it. I'm going to take over that domain. Yep. Yeah, Crazy but this times. is a weird one. I mean, these things happen, I guess, but... Um, so if you had some bounced emails over the weekend, just know that was what the problem might have been. And so just resend that email and it will get through at this point. Mm -hmm. Becca. On Category 5's episode 30 of season 12, we talked about how Elon Musk's Neuralink startup was close to interfacing the brain to computers. Well, now it sounds like he's had some success. In a recent Clubhouse app chat room, the Tesla and SpaceX CEO revealed that Neuralink has implanted a wireless chip in a monkey's brain that enables the monkey to control a video game using only its mind. Oh, Jim Pantry Dive. <laughs> This isn't the first time San Francisco-based Neuralink has experimented on animals with brain implants, as was showcased last year when neural signals from a wired-up pig named Gertrude were displayed before a live audience. Neuralink has now expanded their testing to simians. Musk explained that the startup's eventual intention is... Um, sorry, eventual intention is to create a wireless implantable chip to be used for human beings with quadriplegia or paraplegia. The implant will make it possible for them to use a smartphone, computer mouse, or any handheld device using mind control. Musk even has the lofty goal of eventually using such interfaces to keep step with advanced artificial intelligence. The process of connecting such an implant to the human brain will be a short, non-invasive, one-hour operation. The device is coin-sized, and once the electrodes are installed beneath the scalp, only a small scar will be left behind. Musk says, there are primitive versions of this device with wires sticking out of your head, but it's like a Fitbit in your skull with tiny wires that go into your brain. Regarding the simian experiment, he said, You can't see where the implant is, and he's a happy monkey. We have the nicest monkey facilities in the world. We want them to play mind pong with each other. Videos of these simian experiments will be made available soon, possibly within the next month. 
What are your thoughts on putting computer chips into human brains to help those with disabilities? Do you envision a future where human brains have been altered to compete with AI robots? How do you feel about Musk experimenting on animals? Let us know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Planet of the Apes. <laughs> with <laughs> microchips in their brains. That's right. <laughs> with little, yeah. <laughs> this is an interesting story because it's not a new concept. Uh, you know, the idea of neural pathways within the brain being linked up to computers. Yeah. I mean, we've heard about it all the time. And the idea of using it for quadriplegia or paraplegia, you know, I think is an amazing thing. Sure is. It's totally within the realm of, you know, acceptable use of technology to have that link to be able to give people a better sense of quality of life, which I yeah. absolutely love. And I think it's so amazing. You know, monkeys playing Pong. Or I guess it was the pig playing Pong, but, you know, whatever game the monkey was playing. I mean, monkey, yeah. you have to, you know, test it somewhere. But this is, a, this is an interesting story because if it does work in the way that they hope to advance, it's going to change people's lives. For sure the is. Yeah, yeah, if it's used for the good. Now, it, it could also power mechs. Sure. <laughs> well, and I mean, that's going to be, you know, one of the byproducts of it. It's like, oh, hey, sure. we can do this for good. But, oh, you know, how is somebody be able to use this? Yep. Negatively. I mean, like I was reading a, an article the other day that uh, drones are now getting faster than, uh, you know, we our uh, defense mechanisms can actually address. Sure. So it's like, what oh, happens? Absolutely. If, so what now happens couple if you have AI drones that are, this. you know. And we're talking like Neuralink. So yeah. Neuralink is to augment the human brain because the human brain is the fastest computer on the planet Earth. That's right. And, and possibly in the entire universe. So if we can now augment that and make it so that it can communicate in real time with computers, now AI and humans can interact at the same speed. Yeah. Theory, like, hey, I'm simplifying, right? But yeah. So then it, it raises the concerns, well, what if AI wants to do some, some damage, right? Because that's, that's the, you know, the sci-fi future is of this dystopian... AI has taken over and, and humans are now under their control. So there's all these kinds of crazy concerns. Mm -hmm. So there have to be things put into place to protect absolutely. the user. But from a perspective of medical, uh, oh, so it cool. absolutely fantastic. And I mean, I'm thinking even, um, you know, you've got people who, you know, have, you know, degenerative brain, um, you know, like uh, Alzheimer's and sure. different things where oh, suddenly yeah. you lose the ability to talk. I mean, you think of ALS. How, you know, obviously, you know, ALS, you, you lose that ability, but your mind is still active. How amazing would it be mm -hmm. to be able to have that neural link to be able to, it's like, hey, I can't talk to you personally, but here it is through a computer. You know, I'll, I'll just think it and it yeah. comes through and, you know, like all these things. I think it's awesome. It could you know, be. I, th I mean, coma. Uh, sure. Someone who's in a coma comes to mind. It's yeah. like, can that really be? possible to be able to, like it's just unbelievable technology oh, like we're living sure. in a sci-fi era oh absolutely and we're going to see this just growing by leaps and bounds i mean if it's a, if it's working in a monkey right now you know you know what's next well for sure but it, it does i mean becca brought up a good question how do you feel about testing on animals yeah you know and i have to i truthfully i struggle this one i i, struggle. I think i do too i, I mean i understand that we have to be able to do things safely. Yes. And so to, to, you know, you bridge that gap with some animals and it's not a new thing. I mean, animals are used for science all the time. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, by no means am I condoning, you know, horrible treatment of animals. Please sure. don't take it that way. But I understand you have to have that balance. Um, you know, but I do struggle with this one going, you know, this one doesn't seem that invasive here hearing about it like it's a little chip a couple of neurons it's an hour surgery it's not a big deal and that's the point in this in what we're hearing and then the thing that comes to mind is well what about the the first 10 that we tried it on well yeah which we don't hear about and and i don't want to go there i don't want to put a negative spin on a really powerful awesome technology and and a, a story that is very possibly going to change lives for the better for sure but that is a concern that's, for sure i mean hey what do you think i mean becca said comment below post your comments. It doesn't have to be about the treatment of animals and things like that. But the technology is just unbelievable. Like, I just feel like the, the whole, the past, like, five, six years, we're seeing this sci-fi vision of writers from 25, 30 years ago 
coming to fruition in, in a way that it's like, this is, this is reality. Mm -hmm. This is our reality. Yeah. I even saw a working, hovering skateboard. So, I mean, it's, what? it's here. Like Marty McFly, Back to the Future? <laughs> I'll post the link to the video That's in cool. the description below. Don't miss the other stories we're following this week. First, OnePlus co-founder Carl Pei has revealed next to nothing about his new company, but we'll tell you all about it. Plus, the official .com domain for the Perl programming language was hijacked last week. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to make sure you catch the full stories. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Thanks for watching.